Thank you for joining us for the first session of the ISPD Virtual Education Series. My name is Dr. Lorraine Dugoff, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. We'll be hearing from Dr. Louise Wilkins Haug, past president of ISPD, to welcome you to the virtual series, and Dr. William Peranto, who will be giving our featured presentation on CRISPR. The timing of this lecture couldn't be better as the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was just awarded to Emmanuel Carpentier and Jennifer Doudna for developing CRISPR technology just today. Before we get started, I have a few comments to share. If you need technical assistance, please use the chat function for support. The, present, the pre presenters have pre-recorded their talks. We will broadcast the recordings and then we'll have a live Q&A and discussion. Throughout the broadcast, you can submit questions for the presenter in the Q&A function, and we'll address these at the end of the session. You can use the thumbs up button to vote for the questions you like most, which will push, push them higher up the question list. You may also choose to raise your hand to ask a question, and the moderator may call on you. Statements expressed by the presenters are those of the participants individually and do not represent the opinion or position of the ISPD. This event is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, do not raise your hand to speak or submit a question to the Q&A. I would like to introduce our speakers for today. First, we will hear from Dr. Louise Wilkins Haug. Louise is the Division Director for Maternal Fetal Medicine and Reproductive Genetics at Brigham and Women's Hospital and professor at Harvard Medical School. She's the current past president of ISPD. Dr. Peranto is an attending surgeon in the Division of Pediatric General, Thoracic, and Fetal Surgery at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, and an assistant professor of surgery at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He completed his medical school training at Penn, general surgery training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and pediatric surgery training, including dedicated time in the Center for Fetal Research at CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. His clinical interests include fetal and neonatal surgery and general pediatric surgery. His research interests include in utero cell transplantation and gene therapy, including gene editing for genetic diseases. We are thrilled that he's agreed to give this talk on CRISPR-mediated gene editing for ISPD. We'll now enjoy a welcome from Louise, followed by Bill's talk. After their presentations, we will have time for live Q&A. Thank you. Welcome to the Fall 2020 ISPD Virtual Education Series. When I closed my first year of the presidency in Singapore in 2019, little did I know that we would not be returning to the full audiences, the spontaneity of some of the presenters, the hands-on workshop, and most importantly, the one-on-one -on -one discussions had at posters over coffee and over lunch that are so inspiring from our meetings. Certainly, uh, the global COVID-19 pandemic is felt by everyone in the audience, and I extend to you my condolences for the losses of family, friends, and colleagues, the illnesses you yourself may have suffered, and the changes in work, which will never be returned to normal. As we went through the past year and through the first six months of this pandemic, the society looked at what were our goals and missions and how best to regroup around these. And certainly a longstanding one has been building global partnerships in genetics and fetal care. And certainly during, 19, during 2020, we pivoted to really align our society to these various goals to engage the next generation, maintain global commitment, and be able to facilitate exchange of research and collaboration, but doing this without annual meetings. Certainly, initially without our annual meeting in June of 2020, but possibly now in the future. So we're launching today our 2020 virtual education series, 
These were, will occur for an hour on Wednesdays in October and November, and will bring a great range of speakers as well as the ever popular debates. These are going to be supported by our corporate council, council through the education fund with complimentary registration. We're also continuing on a monthly basis now our ISPD global updates, which is sent by email to the ISPD membership and their affiliates. And we're continuing to promote our ISPD collaboration corner when we now have um, over a half dozen principal investigators who have listed their studies seeking other investigators or patients into a wide range of studies, including access to the two international COVID registries, the use of stem cells for alpha thalassemia treatment, and fetal interventions for vein of Galen malformation. Lastly, engaging the next generation remains an initiative for the ISPD Society. Complimentary membership um, is still being maintained for all trainees. We have a dedicated website for trainee resources, and we're now launching an online and an app called ISPD Communities, one of which will be focused on trainees and others on the special interest groups as well as communities that can be established and help facilitate not only exchange of resources, exchange of ideas, and um, up-to-date messaging. So I would like to leave you with the new ISPD um, Board of Officers, uh, Dr. Lynn Shitty as the incoming president, Mahesh Golani as the president-elect, Rosa Chu as the secretary, Lee Shulman as the treasurer, and myself as past president, and then also a new array of individuals as our ISPD directors you'll become more familiar with over the next couple of years. I certainly have to thank um, CMG, our management company, for keeping us all on track over the past year. And then the corporate council members as well, who have become part of our education committee and are now being led by Jim Goldberg for Myriad Women's Health. So certainly as you enjoy the virtual education series through October and November, continue to think about how to connect with the global community, reach for innovative approaches for collaboration um, virtually, and rethink platforms for engaging across generations so that we can continue to keep the society strong. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'd like, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, with you today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about in utero gene editing, which is something that we think that one day in the future may hold tremendous promise as a treatment for a select number of monogenic disorders. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. It's always a little bit awkward doing this virtually. Um, I look forward to the question and answer session. And uh, if for some reason I can't answer your questions there, always feel free to email me. So I have no conflicts of interest. Hopefully by the end of the, this uh, discussion, you'll get a little bit better understanding of the basics of what CRISPR gene editing is. Um, you'll appreciate the rationale for in utero gene editing um, and the need for more animal studies uh, to evaluate its feasibility and most importantly, its safety before it becomes something of a clinical reality. And you'll appreciate some of the ethical questions surrounding gene editing and, and some of which are more unique to in utero gene editing. So what is the problem? The problem are birth defects. They are common affecting one in 28 babies uh, born in the United States. They cost our healthcare system $2.6 billion annually and this cost is only gonna go up. They're merciless affecting um, any parent or family or patient, nobody is immune to it. They're mysterious and often overlooked. Most causes are unknown and research into them is frequently underfunded, making it difficult to figure out what the causes are. And then importantly, they're deadly. Their birth defects are the leading cause of infant mortality. And within this category of birth defects, there are some uh, birth defects caused by mutations in single genes or monogenic disorders. Um, and some people estimate that five to 10,000 human diseases can be attributed, attributed to a monogenic disorder. 
they are responsible for 40% of hospital admissions, cause significant morbidity and mortality, and some strike prior to birth and have no effective treatment. Now, I don't need to tell this audience, but with the advances in prenatal care, we're now at a point where most human anatomic and genetic abnormalities can be diagnosed or will be able to be diagnosed before birth. And the ability to diagnose these abnormalities before birth, together with the potential morbidity that they cause, opens up the door for the potential of fetal therapy or fetal treatment. The idea of fetal surgery to treat a structural birth defect is not a new idea. Um, you know, it gained a lot of momentum and began in the 80s under Dr. Michael Harrison at UCSF. And since that time, through a number of rigorous translational animal studies and now um, human cases, open fetal surgery for a select number of anatomic birth defects is acceptable and is considered the gold standard in certain cases. But what does it involve? It is a very involved procedure. It generally involves a large laparotomy in the maternal abdomen, after which the underlying uterus is exposed. An incision in the uterus is made to, un to expose the underlying uh, fetal anatomical defect, here depicted as spina bifida or myelomeningocele. The defect is fixed, and then all the layers that were open are, were subsequently closed uh, to complete the surgery. And don't get me wrong, this has been game changing for a number of patients and their families. There are uh, kids out there who you would have predicted would not have been able to walk, but can walk now because of a surgery like this. But as you can see, they're invasive and not without their risks. What we think the future of uh, fetal therapy is, is a precision fetal therapy. And this would involve um, the delivery of a gene therapy or even a gene editing technology via minimally invasive ultrasound guided technique similar to a fetal blood transfusion. Uh, the, um, the gene therapy is delivered via the umbilical vein to target the genetic mutation in the offending organ to correct the underlying genetic problem and ideally fix a pathology before it even begins. So we think that this is one uh, promising future avenue of uh, fetal therapy. Another promising future avenue, which Dr. DePress will speak about next week, is minimally invasive or fetoscopic approaches to structural birth defects. And so that will be an exciting talk a week from now. now I wanna be clear up front that what we're talking about is uh, gene editing in the mid to late gestation human fetus and not embryonic gene editing, uh, which is a totally different approach uh, and carries with it a number of other and different ethical um, and practical questions. So in order to understand uh, gene editing, it's important to realize that there are a number of different ways to perform uh, gene editing. The most common uh, and popular one nowadays is CRISPR-Cas9. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. it um, it is the most common and popular one because it is relatively easy to use thanks to a lot of the work uh, of um, people like Gen Jennifer Downa and Feng Zhuang and other leaders in the, the field. They have made it such that now many scientists can apply it to their own uh, research interests. There are other gene editing uh, platforms such as zinc fingers and talons and polynucleic acids. But for the majority of this talk, we're going to discuss CRISPR-Cas9. So what is CRISPR-Cas9? Cas9 is a bacterial endonuclease that is part of the bacterial's immune system. Um, it is a uh, endonuclease or a protein that can target a specific sequence and, and, uh, and perform cuts in that DNA sequence. And so uh, people have figured out a way of manipulating the system so that you could provide a guide RNA here to target a uh, sequence within the DNA and make a site-specific uh, double-stranded DNA cleavage. How could this potentially be used for a therapeutic purpose? So there are two predominant ways in which CRISPR-Cas9 um, has been used or can be used. One is non-homologous end joining, and this is uh, graphically depicted here. In this picture, the gene uh, of interest that you're trying to edit is gray. If you provide a, a Cas9 endonuclease together with a guide RNA targeting this gene, you can uh, perform a double-stranded DNA break in the, in the DNA at the target site. And then one of two things will happen using the, the body's normal DNA repair mechanism. Either the cut DNA will come back together the way it had been previously, and in this case, the DNA sequence will be restored and there'll be no change to the gene. Alternatively, 
It's not uncommon for bases to be inserted or deleted at the site of the cut. Uh, these insertions or deletions are called indels. And in, um, the insertion or deletion of bases inev inevitably results in the silencing of a gene. Alternatively, you can imagine using two guide RNAs to cut out a segment of DNA. And so the bottom line is that non-homologous end joining could be used to delete or silence a disease causing gene. Another approach is homology direct repair. In this approach, in addition to providing the Cas9 endonuclease, you also provide a homology template or a repair template depicted uh, here in red. This DNA template is homologous to the site of the DNA that you're targeting for cutting with the exception of the base changes that you'd like to make. And so in this case, Cas9 makes a double-stranded DNA break in the DNA. And in addition to the possibility of doing non-homologous end joining or repairing the double-stranded DNA break without any changes, a third option is that when the body repairs the DNA cut, it incorporates the homology templates such that the new sequence is incorporated into the DNA. And, and one can imagine using this approach to correct a disease-causing mutation. The caveat to homology director repair is that it requires proliferating cells and it is relatively inefficient compared to non-homologous end joining and therefore the default is usually uh, the pathway of providing insertions and deletions with non-homologous non end joining. And then there have been variations uh, on the traditional CRISPR-Cas9 HDR and non-homologous end joining. And this was done by Dr. David Liu's lab at Harvard and MIT and he's developed uh, base editors. And these are essentially catalytically impaired uh, Cas9 uh, proteins, uh, such that the Cas9 cannot make a double-stranded DNA break, but, in, but can only nick the DNA. The catalytically impaired Cas9 protein is hooked up to either the cytosine deaminase or the adenosine deaminase nucleic acid domain of a, of a uh, nucleic acid editing protein. And so this system, the Cas9 and the guide RNA serves as the homing beacon, beacon to direct the cytosine or adenosine deaminase to a specific site in the DNA where either a C to T or G to A change can be made for a cytosine deaminase, or alternatively, an A to G or T to C change can be made for an adenosine deaminase. So using these tools, you could introduce a stop codon or disrupt a splice site uh, to silence a gene, or if the pathologic point mutation matches up to the um, requirements of the base editor, you could in theory use this to correct an underlying pathologic mutation. Uh, important considerations for base editing are the fact that since the base editor does not make a double-stranded DNA break, it is uh, hypothesized to be safer than traditional uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, and also base editing does not require proliferating cells to, to, to function efficiently. So with that background on the different types of CRISPR-mediated base editing, um, what is required for successful in vivo therapeutic gene editing? And this is kind of like the broad thousand foot view. At a minimum, uh, we think you need efficient transduction of the target cell population. And uh, one would argue that that target cell population ideally would be a stem or a progenitor cell in such that any edit or change that you make in the cell can be propagated on to daughter cells and persist for the lifetime of the individual. You need efficient functioning of the gene editing machinery. And then you need to avoid any limiting immune response or barriers uh, to delivering the viral vector or the Cas9 protein. I remind you that the Cas9 protein originated from the bacteria, and so it, it's not unheard of that um, that you could develop an immune response to it. With this knowledge, it kind of brings us to what, it, what would be the rationale for wanting to apply this before birth in utero. And the rationale is based on some normal developmental properties of the fetus. One is the small size of the fetus. The second is the immunologic immaturity or the tolerant nature of the fetus. And the second is that uh, the fetus compared to the adult has a higher number of proliferating and accessible stem or progenitor cells. And then finally, uh, in certain cases, uh, by applying in utero gene editing, you may have the ability to treat a disease prior to birth and prior to the onset of irreversible pathology. I'm gonna just 
focus on a couple of these rationale very briefly. So the fetal size seems very intuitive, but it's it, but it has both scientific as well as practical purposes. So if you know a 16 to 18 week fetus, which is probably the earliest that we would propose ever doing this, weighs approximately 150 grams compared to a four kilogram neonate or a 60 kilogram adult. And so this is a one to 27 to 400 uh, weight ratio. This si these size discrepancies allows you to maximize the dose of the therapeutic agent per weight of the recipient, which often plays into the efficiency of the therapy. But it also has practical um, benefits. And there was you know, a recent article in 2017 published in the New York Times highlighting that with the advent of a lot of great therapeutic uh, gene therapy approaches, one particular roadblock, roadblock is the ability to produce large amounts of viruses uh, that are required to, to make this therapy a reality. And so the smaller size of the fetus would minimize constraints on large batch viral vector production and decreased virus needed would uh, potentially translate into the decreased cost of the therapy. The other rationale is the immunologic immune system of the fetus. And this is not a novel concept as, as many in the audience already know about it. And, and it dates back to the 1940s and 50s when um, Owen, Medawar, Billingham and Brent did some of their uh, key studies. One was in the free martin cattle, where they noted in these uh, uh, calf fetuses that share placental circulation, after the fetuses were born, they could detect cells from uh, calf A and, and calf B when they were an adult and vice versa, suggesting that um, there must have been some tolerance to the uh, twin during, during development. And then uh, later on, a little bit later on, uh, Dr. Medawar, uh, did an experiment in fetal mice where he exposed these mice to adult tissue from an unrelated mouse strain. And then after that fetus was born, he exposed that uh, now born fetus to a skin graft from the donor strain. And uh, that donor strain persisted without any immunologic rejection. Again, suggesting that exposure to a farm protein during prenatal development could lead to immune tolerance. You know, our lab, as well as many other labs, including Dr. McKenzie's at UCSF and Dr. Flake here at CHOP, have done a, done a number of additional studies in the mouse model, both with gene therapy and stem cell transplantation, um, again, highlighting the, this uh, specific point. And here you see um, a, uh, a mid-gestation, late-gestation mouse fetus that is getting a intravascular injection of bone marrow from a MHC mismatched or immunologically mismatched um, GFP mouse donor. These cells are green. And when we look in the organs after birth, you see the green cells in the liver, the bone marrow, and importantly, the thymus. And then when we look later on in life, you can see that these cells persist beyond six months of age, suggesting that the um, mouse is tolerant to the foreign donor and that you can do a skin graft on these BALPC mice, which have white fur with the donor uh, skin, which is black. And you see that the skin graft takes uh, again, just confirming a lot of the findings from the earlier studies uh, in the 1950s and, and 60s. And this is particularly relevant, I think, for uh, gene editing as we think about it going forward. There have been more recent studies showing that if you look in the serum of uh, a number of people walking around today, that you can identify a pre-existing adaptive immune system to Cas9 proteins. It's not surprising that these Cas9 proteins originate from uh, bacterial strains, including, including Streptococcus and Staph aureus, and um, a number of us have at one point or another had a Strep or Staph infection. And then more recently, uh, this group did a study in a mouse model where they immunized an adult mouse with uh, the Cas9 protein. And then uh, at some time later, they came back and tried to edit the liver of these mice using an AAV vector delivering uh, Cas9. They found that they got initial editing of the uh, liver cells. However, with time, the edited cells were lost due to an immune response. Again, highlighting the importance of um, the immune system in the acceptance or potential um, persistence of edited cells uh, after the therapy and the potential benefit of doing it before birth. Now, there are a number of potential diseases that could be could be treated with a gene editing and some may be a good candidate diseases to treat before birth. But obviously, 
And, and listed here on the left side of the screen is, is just a figure of a, a diagram of a human and highlighting some of the diseases that many people think would be good candidates for gene editing. If you want to do gene editing before birth, you have to be able to diagnose the disease before birth. Um, and again, as many in the audience know, there are, there are tremendous advances in prenatal diagnosis um, that are going on and that will continue to go on in the future. But even in the present day, a number of these diseases can already be diagnosed before birth, highlighting the potential of in utero gene editing for a number of different diseases. And so to study uh, the feasibility and safety of in utero gene editing, I've given you the rationale now and, um, and highlighted why, why you might want to even consider it. And now the question is, is it safe and can it be done? And so to study that, um, we and others have turned to uh, the, the mouse model predominantly. Um, this is uh, the mouse model that we use. Um, we have techniques of injecting uh, something into the mouse via the Vitalin vein. Um, and you'll see here, we're just injecting some trifan blue into this vein. And that vein drains directly into the portal. The, that vein drains directly into the portal circulation, which goes right into the liver. And here we see when we inject the Vitalin vein with an adenovirus expressing GFP, we can get a green liver. An alternative injection technique is an intraamniotic injection technique. Um, again, here you see some trifan blue being injected into the amniotic cavity. The injectate kind of swirls around, the injectate swirls around the fetal face. And then because of fetal breathing movements, whatever you inject can be in, essentially inhaled and targeted to the fetal lung. And here we see relatively specific targeting of the mouse fetal lung with an adenovirus expressing GFP after an intraamniotic injection. So using this mouse model and these different injection techniques, we can assess whether or not it's feasible and safe to do gene editing targeting a number of different, number of different organs. You know, the first approach that, that we did was we used this mouse model called an MTMG mouse model. It is not a disease model of a mouse. It is purely a fluorescent reporter mouse model. So it provides some pretty pictures and it is, it is a easy model in which to follow edited cells. And how does it work? So these mice have an MT gene, which is a membrane tomato gene um, that is flanked by LOX P sites. Um, and at baseline, all the cells in the organs of this mice express the red protein. If you use CRISPR or um, a Cre recombinase to cut out the MT gene, then you get expression of the GFP or the green cells. Um, and, you can, and, and you can see that the, the cells throughout the organs of the mice turn green. So this was an easy way of telling whether or not you get editing because a cell turns from red to green. Using this approach and an IV injection in an E16 MTMG fetus, in some preliminary studies, we were able to show when we deliver the, Chris, the Cas9 and the guide RNA targeting the MT gene in either an adenovirus or an AAV virus, that we can get efficient editing in the heart or the liver with inefficient editing in the lung and the brain. And here you just see some immunohistochemistry showing you some pretty pictures of the heart and the liver following adenoviral delivery and AAV delivery of Cas9 targeting the MT protein. So this was great. It was one of the first studies that we did, and we were just able to show that uh, with CRISPR, we could, we could edit the fetal liver and the heart, but could we apply it to a disease model? And the disease model we, uh, we looked at to see if this could be more broadly applied was a mouse model of hereditary tyrosinemia type 1 as a model of other metabolic liver diseases. So what is hereditary tyrosinemia type 1? It's a metabolic liver disease and has an incidence of about 1 in 100,000 with a higher prevalence in certain areas of Canada. It results from mutations in the FAH gene, which causes um, a, an accumulation of toxic metabolites of the tyrosine catabolic pathway. The accumulations of these metabolites results in uh, toxicity in the liver and the kidney. If acute disease presents with severe liver failure and death within the first couple of months of life, and evidence suggests that the liver pathology can begin before birth. If there is no treatment, the life expectancy is only eight years. However, fortunately, there is a, a treatment available and with early screening right after birth, this treatment can be applied to most, to most infants with hereditary tyrosinemia type one. The treatment is called NTBC 
it works by inhibiting the HPD upstream of the FAH uh, enzyme. And by inhibiting the tyrosine breakdown pathway up here, you prevent the accumulation of these toxic metabolites. There are some slight downsides, only there are about 10% of patients that don't re respond to NTBC. There's a question of whether or not there's a continued risk of hepatocellular carcinoma on NTBC, and it does require daily dosing and therefore has some compliance issues. The other treatment for her hereditary tyrosine of type 1, particularly in patients with liver failure, is an orthotopic liver transplant, which is obvious, obviously associated with some limitations and uh, morbidity and mortality. So using this model, our question was, can we use in utero gene editing to provide a one-shot long-term treatment for hereditary tyrosinemia type 1 before the onset of the disease pathology? And how do we propose doing this? So we propose using the base editor to convert either a glutamine or a tryptophan amino acid into a stop codon in the HPD gene, and essentially taking the place of the NTP, NTBC uh, pharmacologic treatment. At first, we screened some of these sites in vitro, and we identified uh, two codons that could be efficiently changed to stop codons with the base editor. And then we turned to the mouse model of tyrosinemia. In this mouse model, adult homozygous mice that have the disease are viable and fertile, um, as long as they're maintained on NTBC. Off NTBC, the mice die by one month of age. So what we did was we, we made it the FAH homozygote mice on NTBC and at 16 days gestation and normal gestation in a mouse is 20 days. We injected an adenovirus containing the base editor and the HPD targeting guide RNA. When the mice were born, we placed them with a foster mom that did not have NTBC. And then we looked at certain outcome measures to see if the editing had worked. What did we find? When we looking here at the left, when we looked at editing at day of life one, we saw that we had an editing efficiency in, in hepatocytes of around 15%. This was before NTBC removal. Then when we removed the NTBC, the editing went up to up to 40% on average and as high as 60% in some animals. And this just speaks to the survival advantage that editing confers to the edited cells. And this hepatocyte editing was associated associated with a significant phenotypic improvement in both survival as well as in weight gain. In these graphs, the uh, edited mice are represented by the red, red uh, lines and the uh, FAH mice on NTBC are represented by the blue lines. And you can see that the edited mice behave equal, if not better, than the mice maintained on NTBC. This is in contrast to the black lines, which are the um, unedited mice in which NTBC is taken off and all of them died by 22 days or so in our study. So this improved weight gain and survival, not surprisingly, was, an, was also associated with an improved liver function. The edited mice in the middle here had liver function that was very similar to um, FAH mice maintained on NTBC, which, both of which were statistically better than mice that uh, passed away. And when we looked at protein expression, uh, which is represented by the brown staining on histology here, in the edited mice, you see a significant decrease in brown staining, which goes along with the silencing of the expression of the HPD protein. So this was all very encouraging, but I'd like to highlight that this was done with an adenovirus, um, which has its risks and benefits. The benefit of an adenovirus is that it can efficiently transduce a number of different cells in a number of different organs. And it has a large packaging capacity, so you can easily fit, fit the large base editor transgene as well as the guide RNA into the adenovirus. But it, is, it is, has some significant limitations when you think about one day doing clinical translation. An adenovirus is known to elicit an adverse immune response, um, which may even occur in a fetus where we know the immune system is, is less robust. Um, and therefore, as we think towards the future, the next step was to uh, try to do in utero gene editing using more clinically relevant delivery techniques. And to this, we um, turn to AAV and lipid nanoparticles. We use a similar setup, except for in this case, we delivered SPCAS9 with the HPD targeting guide RNA in either AAV8 or SPCAS9 mRNA and an HPD guide RNA in a lipid nanoparticle. Of note, this is not base editing, this is traditional uh, CRISPR gene editing, where we're depending on non-homologous end joining to provide indels, which inevitably silence the HPD gene. 
And what did we find? This work was done by Kishida Singh in my lab, and, and it's, these are just some early preliminary studies. We haven't published this. We still uh, need to do more robust studies. But what we found was that using both the LMP and the AAV delivery approach, we could get editing efficiencies of 20 to 30% at two weeks of age, which increased to around 60% by four months, consistent with that survival advantage. Again, we saw a decrease in the HPD protein expression following a delivery of both, via both approaches, and that, this was, uh, and that this was associated with improved weight gain and improved survival, similar to FAH mice maintained on NTBC. Again, all very encouraging that not only with an adenovirus, but with some of these other delivery approaches, we could potentially achieve um, relevant in utero gene editing. So what we've just talked about is in using in utero gene editing to target hepatocytes um, in the fetal liver using a CRISPR-Cas9. The ability to target fetal liver also opens up the possibility of targeting hematopoietic stem cells as well. I, I remind you that during development, the fetal liver plays a major role in fetal hematopoiesis and therefore is the site of hematopoietic stem cells. And being able to target hematopoietic stem cells opens the door to the possibility of treating congenital hematologic diseases like sickle cell, thalassemia, and other genetic anemias. And this is in fact what the group led by uh, Peter Glazer, Mark Saltzman, and David Stittleman from Yale have done using a nanoparticle delivery approach and a non-CRISPR mediate editing uh, called PNAs or polynucleic acids. And Dave Stittleman very nicely provided me with some of these slides. So what are polynucleic acids? So the, this is an enzymatic free gene editing approach. And because it doesn't require an, an enzyme, uh, it's hypothesized by this group to be potentially safer than CRISPR-Cas9. A polynucleic acid DNA complex is targeted via sequence homology to a site in the in the DNA that you want to edit. And when the PNA DNA complex binds, it essentially unzips the double-stranded DNA forming a triplex. This opens up the DNA and allows the repair template to go in and be used um, um, by the DNA repair mechanisms that our body has to incorporate the corrected DNA sequence and, and, um, and fix the underlying mutation. In, in the beginning uh, of their studies, they uh, sought to just determine whether their nanoparticles that they were delivering the PNA DNA complexes in could be targeted to the fetal liver. And what they showed was that in utero injection of these nanoparticles containing luciferase pretty specifically targeted the fetus and did not uh, target the mom. And then when you looked at the organs within the fetus, it targeted the fetal liver uh, more substantially than any other organs. And then they used this approach in a mouse model of beta thalassemia and had some very nice results. They were able to show that they could get uh, on target editing efficiency of up to 6% and that this editing was associated with improved survival compared to untreated beta thal mice. And that um, it was also associated with improved phenotypic markers such as hemoglobin levels represented here by the green bar. Um, their hemoglobin levels were similar to the uh, wild type mice and significantly better than the untreated beta thal mice. There is a reduction in splenomegaly in the, in the edited mice and improved reticulocyte counts in this very nice paper out of Yale. So this was for the liver and the liver is a great target for probably a limited number of uh, genetic diseases, but there are a number of genetic diseases in the liver that don't cause a problem before birth and can be treated after birth. We were also interested in targeting the lung um, for some obvious reasons. The lung, if, it, if it's not functioning well at the time of birth, can cause significant problems right away. So what is the unmet need? Congenital monogenic lung diseases, including alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, and surfactant protein disorders can lead to respiratory failure and death shortly after birth or chronic lung disease. And current treatments for uh, these diseases are based on symptomatic treatments and or culminate in lung transplant. And as you can see by the table here, CF, surfactant protein disorders, and alpha-1 antitrypsin are responsible for a significant portion of lung transplants around the world. Um, and even with a lung transplant, the, um, the outcomes are not perfect. So we turned again to the MTMG mouse model to see if this would be a viable strategy for, uh, uh, for in utero gene editing and if we could target the lung. 
And what we showed with, was that using an interamniotic injection of an adenovirus containing Cas9 and targeting the MT gene that we could get efficient editing predominantly in the epithelial cells of the lung. The epithelial cells are made up of a number of different cell types, including uh, alveolar type 1 and type 2 cells, secretory cells, and ciliated cells. And when we look at those specific epithelial cell types, we noted that we got editing in all the different cell types and that the editing was relatively stable up to six months after the uh, editing. We then applied this to the mouse model of surfactant protein C deficiency. This was done in collaboration with uh, Ed Morrissey and Michael Beers at the University of Pennsylvania. So this mouse model in humans, in humans is a gain of function mutation in which aggregation of the misfolded protein causes a uh, lung injury. And, and in mice, surfactant protein C is not required for lung function. And so here you see histologic image of what a mouse lung looks like with this disease. On the left is the normal wild type with good alveolar space. And on the right is a homozygous mutant mouse. And you can see the lung looks pretty solid. And you could imagine why these mice die within hours after birth with it, because they cannot breathe. So our approach, given that it was a gain of function mutation, was just to use uh, gene editing to cut out the uh, mutant gene, um, prevent the accumulation of the misfolded protein, and stop the lung injury. And so what did we find? Uh, in the mouse model, we found that we had improved survival up to 6%. It's not great, but it is better, obviously, than 0% uh, survival by six hours of life. And when we look at some of these mice that survived um, up to a week of age, um, and we look histologically, we see that the edited mice uh, depicted here on the left look very similar to E6 mice injected with an adenovirus or uninjected uh, wild-type mice. And then when we look at some morphometric parameters on the on the edited mice, we see that they're also very similar to the um, um, to the B6 and wild type mice, suggesting that in utero gene editing can target the lung um, and have a phenotypic improvement. You know, additional future studies in the mouse model are needed to look at more clinically relevant delivery techniques, and we also uh, think it's highly valuable to do this in a large animal model uh, as a preclinical model. We've begun again doing some preliminary studies in the large animal model. This was in the sheep model, where we take a, a mid-gestation fetal sheep and deliver via an intratracheal route an adenovirus expressing Cas9 and a guide RNA targeting surfactant protein C. And what we see is that we get up to 6% editing in the lung cells. Again, very preliminary, we need to see which cells in the lung are edited. If it lasts for a long time, can we use different delivery techniques, but at least uh, we show the feasibility of doing it in a large animal model. And surfactant protein C is a great uh, disease, but obviously, you know, the white whale out there and the, the big target that many people are interested in is cystic fibrosis. There was a recent study in science translational medicine using pharmacologic treatments to treat uh, CS in the ferret model of CF. And this study was very nice in that it highlighted that earlier treatment in utero could have beneficial effects in multiple organs that are involved in CF. Again, adding strength to the argument of treating cystic fibrosis before birth. And then that group from Yale that did the very nice study in beta thalassemia has done some nice studies using their nanoparticle PNA approach to correct the Delta 508 mutation in an adult mouse model of CF. And recently presented work at the ASGCT meeting about a year ago highlighting uh, or demonstrating that they could translate this to their in utero approach. So this is um, very exciting work done out of done out of EL. So that's uh, some of the data, uh, hopefully um, giving you an idea that that this stuff is can be is feasible. Um, and, and it's possible, uh, although a lot of work still needs to be done. But it also raises some ethical and safety questions. Gene editing by itself raises ethical questions. And then when you apply it, before birth, it just adds another layer to this discussion. And so what are some of the ethical or safety questions? This is a list of a couple. It's by no means complete. And a lot of these uh, considerations are discussed in these four uh, papers highlighted here, two of which are a consensus statement from the IFETUS meeting, which is a small group of us that like to um, focus on uh, prenatal uh, treatments for cell and prenatal cell and gene therapy treatments for genetic and congenital uh, hematologic disorders. 
But here are some of the ethical uh, and safety considerations. The potential for mutagenesis at other sites in the genome or otherwise known as off-target effects causing uh, deleterious um, uh, results. The pot potential risk of unintended AAV integration. There's always a question of, are we editing the germline? That is not our intention. The risk of exposure of the, to, of the mother to the viral vector in gene editing technology. In addition to that, there are procedural risks to the mother and the fetus. Um, another thing to consider is that target diseases are often prevalent in historically vulnerable populations. And so this mandates the involvement of patient family disease group stakeholders in research and future clinical translations, hopefully early on in those discussions. And then there are also some potential difficult situations. So what, do you, what about the difficult situation in which a prenatally fatal disease may be partially corrected, resulting in a birth of a disabled child with severe long-term morbidity? So this is just a list of a couple. Um, we've begun to look at some of these issues. Again, it is by no means complete in our animal models. Uh, and, and this is some of those results in the context of the issue of off-target effects. When we look at off-target effects in the mouse model when uh, following liver-targeted gene editing or lung-targeted gene editing uh, using either traditional CRISPR or base editing approaches, we didn't see any off-target effects above that of the background. Similarly, the group out of Yale using the PNA approach did not notice any off-target effects above background. Uh, in their study in the beta fowl mice. And in early studies in the sheep model, we didn't uh, identify any significant off-target effects uh, in, the, in the top 10 uh, listed off-target uh, sites here. The highest one was 0.33% over a background of 0.08%. It's unclear whether or not, is, whether or not that is of significance. But I, I warn you that all of these studies, both the ones that we've done and the ones done at Yale, are a somewhat biased approach. We pick the off-target sites to analyze based on a computer algorithm that is based on the sequence of the guide RNA, matching it up to sequence homology in the genome and identifying what are the most likely sites that could also be hit by that guide RNA. There have been a number of studies that have highlighted the need for unbiased um, approaches to off-target analysis, um, both using base editing as well as traditional CRISPR-Cas9. And then in addition, this is related to traditional gene therapy as well as uh, gene editing using an AAV as a delivery approach. Uh, traditionally, AAV is thought to exist episomally. And in fact, it does exist uh, for the most part as an episomal, um, uh, as, an op as an episome within the target cell. But there have been a number of studies that, that demonstrate that AAVs can integrate, albeit at a very low rate, within the genome, and that sometimes this, this integration can occur at sites near uh, cancer genes. And then a more recent study showed that when you use AAV to deliver CRISPR-Cas9, inducing a double-stranded DNA break, that this integration could be even, um, even more significant. And so that's just something to also consider. This is a key safety or ethical question. Um, and it's well known to all of us here that fetal interventions involve two patients, both the mother and the fetus, with the safety of the mom being of utmost priority. And the mom is, is often an innocent bystander. She is not affected by the disease, but she has the potential to be affected by the therapy. And when you think of risk for the mother, in my head, we can divide very broadly into procedural risks as well as risks that are specific to the therapy. For procedural risk, when we're talking about in utero uh, gene editing or gene therapy, what we imagine is a minimally invasive ultrasound, ultrasound guided approach similar to what would be used for an uh, umbilical um, blood transfusion in fetus, fetuses with fetal anemia. Uh, and so you can look back at the, um, the risk profile for that procedure. There is one series of 937 transfusions for fetal anemia between 2001 and 15, and they demonstrated a, a complication rate of 1.2%. And these are the complications listed here. And they also noted that future pregnancies did not seem to be adversely affected by ultrasound guided umbilical vein transfusion. So we think that the procedural risk uh, for an in utero gene therapy or gene editing um, should be minimum or could be minimized in the, in the future. The other uh, risk for the mom is, is dependent on what you're injecting. And in this case is a gene editing technology. So the question is, is there potential of editing the maternal organs? 
And at least from you know, early studies in the mouse and the sheep model, we did not appreciate any significant editing in the maternal organs of moms of, of fetuses that had undergone in utero gene editing. The other safety issue or ethical question is germline gene editing. And, and do you get germline gene editing in a developing fetus if you do in utero gene editing? And again, early studies in the mouse and the sheep model show that we did not identify, we did not have any editing in mouse uh, spermocytes or ovaries from the edited fetuses. And similarly in the gonads of the sheep, we did not notice any editing there. When we, um, finally, when we made it uh, edited mice, uh, none of their offspring had an edited genome, again, suggesting that at least in the, these limited number of studies, we did not achieve any germline gene editing in our fetuses that underwent in utero gene editing. And this brings us to the point where I think it's worth highlighting the difference between early embryo gene editing and late gestation or mid gestation fetal gene editing. You can divide it into these four main uh, topics and compare the two. One is target specificity. In utero gene editing, in theory, could be used to target specific organs and cell populations using specific delivery approaches and delivery vectors, as well as delivery uh, uh, techniques. In contrast, early embryo gene editing is more likely to target all of the cells of the, of the organism. Germline gene editing is not a, uh, has not been demonstrated, at least in early studies following in utero gene editing, but in early embryo gene editing, you would expect to have germline gene editing. In utero gene editing does have the potential ex uh, exposure of the mother to the, to the therapy. Embryo gene editing is done ex vivo and therefore uh, there is uh, no risk of editing the maternal organs. And then finally, <clears throat> early embryo gene, gene editing can only be used for uh, mutations that are diagnosed pre-implantation. This contrasts with in utero gene editing, which is done you know, mid gestation in which de novo mutations um, uh, or uh, mid gestation diagnosis of a genetic disease could be potentially amenable to gene editing. And then this is the last point. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of genetic diseases um, disproportionately affect vulnerable populations which may not have good access to care uh, or tolerate high cost of therapy. In that, in that context, um, there was one survey where they asked hemophiliac uh, families what their thought was on gene therapy in general, including in utero gene editing. Uh, from a cost perspective, they thought, they acknowledged that in the long run, it would be cheaper. However, if it was too expensive up front, it wouldn't be something that they were interested in. We did a very cursory uh, cost analysis based on hereditary tyrosinemia type one, uh, taking into consideration the available treatment, which is NTBC, um, and what we thought uh, in utero gene editing costs would look like. And when you look at the dollars spent per quality adjusted life here, gray, the gray bar here is in utero gene editing. And as you can see, the cost is very high up front, but the quality adjusted life here significantly reduces with time uh, compared to the chronic uh, requirement of NTBC, and on average, uh, in utero gene editing would be five to 10 times less than NTBC treatment. So with this in consideration, one day in the future, how would you select what would be the best disease or patient uh, to treat with in utero gene editing? So these are some points to consider. We think that the, disease, that the patient and the disease would require reliable prenatal genetic diagnosis. There should be a strong genotype-phenotype correlation. You want to know that correcting the genotype with in utero gene editing is the reason why you have any phenotypic correction and not just because it's the natural history of the disease. Um, ideally, it would be used for diseases that result in significant morbidity and mortality and or irreversible pathology before or shortly after birth. After birth. Um, there, the fetus should have no other serious abnormalities that are being targeted for correction by in utero gene editing. And, and no matter what the disease is, it is imperative that non-directive multidisciplinary counseling is provided in which the option of no intervention versus experimental intervention with all the risks and benefits are explained and without uh, imparting your own personal bias. So in conclusion, I hope I've been able to shed a little light and, um, and demonstrate to you that in utero gene editing is, a fe is feasible in the mouse model and that it can correct the mouse models of some human monogenetic diseases. 
Early studies indicate that, no, that mid to late gestation gene editing does not affect the germline or maternal tissues, but future studies to evaluate its safety are required in small and large animal models, and some of these studies uh, you know, are ongoing currently. I'd like to thank uh, everybody in my lab and the collaborators and my mentors, Dr. Adzik and Dr. Flake, have been long-term mentors to me here at CHOP uh, since I was a medical student and continue to, to be my mentors today. This is a list of uh, my uh, former and current lab members who've contributed a lot to the work that we've presented. This is a picture of us on Penn's uh, campus when uh, I guess it was last fall before we um, were socially distancing. Uh, a lot of the work is done because of great collaborations I have with people at Penn, including Kieran, Kieran Musunuro, who's one of the experts in the field of gene editing, Ed Morrissey in his lab, who is an expert in pulmonary developmental biology, Rajan, a cardiologist uh, and epigenetic expert, and uh, Mike Mitchell at the Bioengineering Engineering School at Penn, uh, who we have formed a great uh, collaborative relationship with to explore nanoparticle-mediated approaches. So thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions during the question and answer session. And uh, if you don't get to ask them, then please feel free to email me. Hope everybody is uh, doing well and having a good day. Thank you, Bill, for that excellent presentation. But we now have time for questions. Uh, we'll extend this session uh, until 15 minutes after the hour. Uh, but before as we start, just a couple reminders. Um, so please put your questions for the presenter in the Q&A function and use the thumbs up button to vote for the questions that you like the most. And if you have a comment or want to speak out loud, um, just raise your hand, use the raise your hand feature. And if we have time, we'll get to you. Uh, we'll unmute you and call your name to let you know that you can speak, uh, but you will have to accept permission to speak. Okay, so it looks like we have some questions. Um, and the first one uh, is from Dirk Lindout. Um, so the question is, most if not all disorders discussed can be diagnosed with pre-implantation genetic testing with a subsequent option for selecting the unaffected conceptuses without further interference. So the question is, what is the ratio to promote gene editing of affected conceptuses and discarding the option of using unaffected conceptuses without taking unknown long-term risks? So I think that's, uh, thanks for the question and thanks for tuning in. I think that's a, a very good point. Um, you know, I highlight that what, what we're studying is uh, in utero gene editing in mid to late gestation fetuses, presumably for patients that don't undergo IVF or pre-implantation uh, testing. I agree if the family is interested in undergoing IVF and pre-implantation testing that it makes sense if you have the ability to choose an uninfected uh, uh, embryo that that would that would make more sense uh, than than editing, but this is uh, again a different uh, time and and potentially opens up the possibility of applying gene editing for mutations that are diagnosed de novo after a pregnancy has already uh, begun, or uh, again uh, families that uh, have gotten pregnant via the traditional route and not via IVF. Okay, we have a question about the cost. Um, this is from Tim Van Megum. Um, and the question is, could you comment a bit more on the costs of gene editing? I understand development cost of these therapies is very high, but why would costs remain so high once a therapy has been developed? You know, I mean, that's a great question. I am by no means a business person <laughs> or, an, or an MBA. So, I mean, that very cursory cost benefit analysis that, that uh, actually sort of boys, who's a, who's a very smart uh, general surgery resident that's doing time in my lab also as an MBA, he did was based on what the current cost is for the limited gene therapy products that are out there. Uh, one for uh, genetic eye disease, Luxerna, the other for uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and for them, the, the cost of the therapy up front is, is very, very high. Um, and again, it's beyond my, my knowledge as to why. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of investment from a research and development perspective uh, it costs a lot of money to make the vector uh, in a uh, GMP in a uh, clinically grade uh, fashion, um, but the costs up front are generally high, and, and there are multiple approaches to try to um, uh, to reduce the costs or or cover those costs via insurances. But 
but unfortunately, I don't have a good explanation for why it would be so high. Okay. Another question, if only a fraction of target sales get edited, are there long-term increases or decreases in the proportion of edited and original sales? And then long-term, does the patient get better and better or eventually have a decline in the quote cure? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I think it totally depends on what the disease is that you're treating. So for um, some diseases like uh, hereditary tyrosinemia, which we did in the mouse model, there is a known selected, selective advantage or survival advantage for the edited or corrected cells. And so in that, in that disease, you'd expect the edited cells to increase uh, in, per, in percentage of the unedited cells. Similarly for Fanconi anemia, it's known that there's a survival advantage for normal cells versus um, disease cells. But in other disease states, that, that survival advantage might not exist. And in those cases, there's no reason to expect the edited cells would, would increase in number over time to increase the, the uh, effect of the therapy. And uh, we have a question from Lisa Butterfield. For fetal treatment, how early in the pregnancy would the disorder have to be diagnosed to offer treatment? Uh, in clinical practice, considering the current diagnostic techniques, is it realistic to make a diagnosis early enough to provide treatment? Yes, that's another very good question. And I, I think, uh, yes, it is realistic. Practically speaking, um, if we imagine that the way this would be applied one day after, uh, and again, I like to highlight that a lot of these studies are, are just beginning and they're done in animal models and a lot of more work needs to be done to demonstrate their safety before we think about clinical translation. But from a practical perspective, we would imagine it would be done um, like an in utero blood transfusion, which you know may take place around 24 or 25 weeks gestation. And I think um, that that time frame may allow for the diagnosis prior to the time that the therapy is initiated. Uh, also importantly, um, for many of these diseases which are recessive, a family may have already had an affected sibling, and so they may be um, uh, more prone to undergo uh, screening and early diagnosis if they choose not to do uh, IVF, as pointed out by the earlier question. And so in those families, it might be uh, easier to, um, to diagnose the, the uh, disease prior to, uh, prior to the, the the time at which the therapy would need to be initiated. Okay, Kathleen Bradley asked this question, uh, which conditions do you consider the most important or are you focusing on, or are you focusing on for in utero treatment uh, so we can inform our patients? Oh, so we can inform our patients. Yeah, so I think that the most, uh, the ideal disease is a, for this type of treatment would be a disease that causes uh, significant health problems and or irreversible pathology before birth. Um, and that gives you the rationale for wanting to, to do this before birth. Um, and I, I think a lot, of, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, like a lot of the lysosomal storage diseases can cause irreversible pathology or significant pathology during development. And they may be a, one of the, the earlier uh, disease targets uh, for something like this. Um, Again, all these studies right now are mainly in animal models, and we're not at the point where we would, uh, where we would think about translating them to, to people just yet. But, but our hope is in the next five to 10 years, it might be uh, more of a clinical reality. Yeah, an anonymous question. Uh, do you think this kind of gene editing would be best relevant for a scenario where a genetic diagnosis is made de novo in early pregnancy, uh, since these families would not have the option of PGT? Yeah, no, I think that that's a great point. I think um, this type of gene editing would be more applicable to a family like that, uh, which wouldn't have the option of PGT. Okay, any, any other questions? We welcome your questions. Okay, well, then this concludes the first session of the ISPD virtual education series. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and give a special thank you to our speaker, Bill per Peranto. Uh, this presentation was recorded and will be available on, on the ISPD website. 
Certificates of attendance and CEUs will be available at the conclusion of the entire virtual education series. Uh, so we encourage all of you to join for additional lectures in our series. Our next session in the series will be next Wednesday, October 14th at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and at that time, Jan Depressed will be speaking about the total trial. So be sure to check the ISPD website for the link to register uh, for this as well as upcoming topics. There are some great debates that will be presented. Uh, and I wanna just thank everyone again and wish you all a good day or evening depending where you are. Thank you so much. Thank you.